afternoon, gents, and maybe a few ladies if you're joining us. Uh, welcome to today's live, today's presentation, 37 Strategies to Optimize Sleep, Boost Testosterone, and Increase Your Energy. Now, before we get going, there's a lot to cover today. There's a lot. It's a big topic. I want to try and get done in 45 minutes, but it might run over. <clears throat> but just rest assured, if you registered for the live, you're going to get a copy of the slides. I'm going to email you the video so you can catch up when you can. If you're coming in live and just say hi in the chat, let me know where you are. Let me know what's going on, what you're working on, your health and fitness. I said, um, I'm not going to do too much on the intro stuff because if you've come through LinkedIn, which I would say that probably 95% of you that have registered are coming through LinkedIn, you know exactly who I am. You know the type of, type of stuff that I do. You know who I work with. You know my vibes. I'm not going to spend 15, 20 minutes saying why you should listen to me and who I work with. You kind of already know that. We've got a lot to go through. But um, before we start, I want to see who comes on live and we can have a chat. If you've got a question, here's what I would like you to do. Drop it into the chat. And if I see it and it doesn't throw me off the slides that I'm going to go through, I'll answer it if it is, if it is reasonably relevant. If I don't see it and I don't think it's going to be um, or it might throw me off and I'm on a roll with something in particular, I'm going to answer the questions at the end, if that's OK with you. All right. So if you're on live, just say hi. If not, we're going to get straight into it. Give it 30 seconds. And I hope you hopefully you can hear me. OK, I just realized I didn't put on my um, little microphone, which I said I was going to do. And it's probably too late to do that. So I'm hoping you can hear me. OK. And my Mac is going to pick up the sound. OK. Right. I'm going to get straight in with it, guys. I said there's a lot to cover. 37 strategies to optimize sleep, boost testosterone, and increase your energy. I'll let you into a little secret. I just made 37 up. There's actually going to be a lot more than that, a lot more information. But when we're marketing to you guys, it's very good to do an odd number. So it could have been 17. It could have been 47. It was too much. 37 sounded like a great idea, but there's actually a lot more information than that. So don't be sitting there thinking, oh, that was only 36 or there was 50 tactics. There's going to be a lot of information I know that you're going to get some great value from. All right, so on we, with the presentation. So 37 strategies to optimize sleep, boost testosterone, and increase your energy every single damn day. So straight in with the good stuff. This is what we're going to cover. First of all, we're going to look at sleep. And I've broken it down into the areas that I want to cover. We're going to look at um, the benefit, why we need sleep and the lack of sleep, what harm the lack of sleep will actually do to you. And I think we all know how important sleep is. But we're going to drill down and really why you should be getting good sleep. And then we're going to recommend a couple of books. We're going to look at things that disrupt sleep, so sleep disruptors. Then we're going to look at some st a strategy or strategies that you can do to mitigate a bad sleep. So let's say you have a horrendous night's sleep. Uh, what can you do the morning after? Then we're going to look at some strategies to actually get a great sleep. We're going to look at nutrition and supplements that will help with sleep. We'll look at some sleep hacks and some, you know, an overall... Um, strategies, my top nine strategies that will help you get great sleep. And then we're going to look at the bedtime ritual, which is the key to getting very, very good sleep. All right. Anyone there? Anyone saying hi? I can see a few of you popping in, but not ready with a question. All right, here we go. So first of all, let's look at um, what lack of sleep will do. Now, we all know the power of getting a good night's sleep. It literally affects everything in life. And if you're getting very, very bad sleep, um, it affects every single area of your life in a negative way. And there's, it's said that there's three pillars of health, sleep, exercise, and nutrition. And I don't actually believe that to be true. I believe sleep is the base that we need to work from. And the pillars that stand on the base are exercise and nutrition. You can have the best exercise in the world, the best nutrition in the world, but if you're sleeping badly, become irrelevant. So we want to focus on sleep as the, the, the priority in life. It really is one of the most important things we need to focus on. Nutrition and then exercise can be the pillars that stand on that. It's the number one thing that we can do for mental, physical and emotional health. And here's the thing. It's free. It's available to every single one of us, yet many of us neglect it. An interesting fact that I was, when I was putting together these slides, um, I found this fact that humans are the only creatures or mammals, animals on the planet that will intentionally delay their bedtime because of, you know, 
the internet or going out or going to a bar or going to dinner where every other animal, every single species gets to bed or goes to sleep on time, depending, and that's obviously hardwired into their, their DNA. Uh, anyway, it's just an interesting little fact. Um, bad sleep will suppress your immune system and doubles your risk of cancer. Doubles your risk of cancer. And we're talking less than six hours. Consistently less than six hours, you're going to double your risk of cancer. And the WHO, the World Health Organization, has actually put down poor sleep or lack of sleep and sleep um, workers that do shift working, uh, shift workers rather, um, it stands as a carcinogen risk, which means there's an actual defined risk for getting cancer. Uh, bad sleep will increase the risk of Alzheimer's, stroke and heart disease. Terrible, isn't it? And with relation to burning body fat, it really messes with two important hormones, leptin and ghrelin. And I've talked about this previously on other presentations, other lives. Leptin and ghrelin are two hunger hormones. Leptin is our satiety hormone. It makes you, tells you whether you've had enough to eat. Ghrelin is our hormone that says eat more. So when you get bad sleep, it really screws with these level of hormones every day. So you wake up and you're always hungry. You're craving carbohydrates. You're craving sugar. So from a health perspective and losing body fat or maintaining your weight perspective, you can see that having bad sleep is one of the worst things you can do. So lack of sleep won't actually cause you to gain weight, but it will fuck with your hormones that could cause you to overeat. Okay, Poor sleep, usually it, it causes people to have less energy the next day. Less energy equals less movement, and that could mean less fat or more weight gain. Of course, it depends on how much you eat. So it's not a, determined, a, a direct correlation with weight loss or weight gain, but it will really mess with the hormones that dictate that, and it's very hard to ignore that. Okay, Get some sleep. I think we all know that really, don't we? Here's my two favorite books. And there's loads of books on sleep. And I whittled it down to my two favorite books. Uh, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker is probably the, the best book I've ever read, certainly about sleep. But it was one of the few books where every page I was literally going, oh, my God, I can't believe it. It's like jaw-dropping information, jaw-dropping information. Um, Matthew Walker is a scientist, a sleep scientist. I first heard about him when he went on the Joe Rogan podcast. And I know Rogan gets a bit of a bad rap, but occasionally does get some fantastic guests. And Matthew Walker was on there. I bought his book. It's a fantastic book. That's my number one recommendation. Okay. So a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, I've got from there um, and from my own personal experience I've used over the years and with my clients. So Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. And another guy, Sean Stevenson, Sleep Smarter. Another two, another book to check out. So check those two books out if you get a chance. Amazon is your friend. Click them. You'll be better off for buying those books, I promise. Okay, let's look at some of the things that disrupt sleep. Now, I know that most of you know this. Some of you might not, but most of you know. But here's the thing in health and fitness. Most people aren't looking after the basics. Most people know this stuff, but it doesn't mean you're actually taking action. It doesn't mean you're actually putting these techniques into place. So I'm going to go over the basics because it's the basics that move you forward. It's the basics that move the needle forward and get in taking action with the basics consistently over a period of time is what's going to create the best results in anything. So we're going to go over the basics. So things that disrupt sleep, coffee. We know that, okay? Now, coffee's got a half-life of about six hours, which means if you drink 500 milligrams of coffee, caffeine rather, which is could be two or three strong cups of coffee, half of that will be, half of that caffeine will be in your blood system six hours later. Okay, so if you're having a coffee at 2 p.m., 500 milligrams, cup of coffee by 2 p.m. Come 7 p.m., 8 p.m., you've still got 250 milligrams of that. And then another six hours later, you've got 125 milligrams. So you, people say, well, it's not affecting my sleep. If you're a bad sleeper, if you're a light sleeper, or you struggle to get to sleep, first of all, look at your coffee intake, or your caffeine intake. I mean, there's caffeine in tea, but not as much. Um, so half-life for six hours, so be aware of coffee. Alcohol, we all will know that... Um, drinking alcohol disrupts our sleep and late night eating. So there's two the, the two or three things from a diet perspective that we want to at least be aware of. Stress, big one, family, work, life, stress in life. Most of my clients often tell me that they're you know, lying in bed, they just can't get to sleep or when they wake up, their mind is racing. So sleep is one of the biggest indicators for, for poor sleep disruptors. 
And here's the big one. The screen that I'm on now, this little bad boy smartphone, which I don't think it's that smart really, is it? Bring back the time when all you could do was make a phone call and text. Bring back the 90s, early 2000s, before the smartphone was invented. But blue light from any screen, laptop, phone, um, it blocks melatonin. It blocks melatonin. Now, melatonin, if you don't know, is a hormone. Sleep hormone is produced by the pineal gland. Pineal gland sits right in the middle of the forehead there. Um, and it basically gets released when it gets dark. So as soon as it starts to get dark, body switches, thinks, okay, we're time to get to sleep. We'll release hormone and it tends to make you sleepy. That's all the melatonin does. But when you get this artificial light, because, you know, come 9, 10 p.m., if you look at the animals, when it gets dark outside, they're not on their screens. They're thinking, okay, it's getting dark, it's time to sleep, unless it's a nocturnal animal where they sleep during the day. But the majority of the other creatures on the planet shut down, they get to bed on time. We don't. We're disrupting it by staying up, we're watching Netflix, we're scrolling on the gram, checking our emails, all that bullshit that we don't need to do, okay? Stop it. And we're going to look at strategies to try and avoid that. Right, so jumping ahead, let's say you have a terrible sleep. Okay? What can you do to mitigate the sleep? Let's say you, for whatever reason, you've slept like shit, you wake up, you feel awful. Here are a few techniques that you can put into practice that are going to actually going to bring you around and make you feel a bit better. First of all, before you have your caffeine, <laughs> excuse me, before you have your coffee, don't go to the coffee first. I know that you, you, you stumble down to the kitchen, you get your coffee on. That's not what we want to do first, okay? We want to have a litre of water with some sea salt, okay? Just rehydrate. And the reason for sea salt, a lot of the time when people just guzzle a load of water, it can go in one end and out the other. And what the sea salt will do, uh, when you consume salt, it'll actually um, store more water in the body. So you're likely, more likely to use it. We're not talking a massive amount of salt. We're talking a small pinch. If you can taste the salt, it's too much. So we're just talking a little pinch into your bottle of water. Um, it'll get some of those electrolytes back into you, and it will help you not pee out the water. So first thing, hydrate first. Then you want to have, if you drink coffee, of course, I'm not telling you to go and drink it if you don't drink it, two coffees max, okay, before midday, really. Third thing you want to do, you want to get outside and you want to move your ass. You want to do some type of exercise. And ideally, you want to stare into the sun. I literally stare into the actual sunlight. But you want to get some sun into your eyes. It's one of the best things to regulate your circadian rhythm. Get out and have some movements. If you get into the gym or you're going for a run, it's one of the best things to do. Despite you probably thinking, well, I don't want to go and do this because I've had a terrible night's sleep. But it's one of the best things that you can do. Okay. Um, eat protein. And keep your fat, your dietary fat, fairly low that day, but get a good amount of protein the next day. Um, and what this does is it releases um, orexin. Okay, now orexin, you may have heard of it, you may not have, is a neuropeptide that regulates arousal, wakefulness, and appetite. So it's one of the best things to, you know, wake you up during the day. Okay. Now, interestingly, narcolepsy is, you know, when people just literally fall asleep. Um, narcolepsy, uh, the the issue with that is actually a lack of orexin in the brain. So that's the, the problem, one of the, 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 the problems with uh, people that get narcolepsy. So we want to stimulate that, make sure we've got lots of that in the system. Um, and all these things, all of these things actually are going to help with orexin. Um, there's a few supplements you can add, um, 1,000 milligram activated charcoal and 1,000 milligram of um, curcumin, which is just turmeric. And they're two really, uh, there's data behind those two supplements. Get them in your water and a couple of the best things you can do to get moving that day. But that's if you've had a terrible night's sleep. But what we really want to focus on is how do we avoid having that bad night's sleep in the first place? How do we have a great night? And it all comes down to different habits. There's a few supplements we can use. And it really comes down to a ritual about getting ready for bed, you know, up to two hours before lights go out. Not easy, but it can definitely be done and can make a big difference. All right, let's look at some strategies for great sleep. Let's first of all look at nutrition and supplements. Okay, so um, this stuff that obviously you can do during the day. And here's the thing. A good night's sleep starts with the day 
So you don't wait until it's time to go to sleep to get a good night's sleep. The things that you do, do during the day are going to promote sleep at night. And guess what? The best way to have a good morning is to have a good night's sleep. But the way you have a good night's sleep is by preparing it for it during the day. So there's different things you can do. Okay, and obviously looking after nutrition is always going to be a great idea. But the sleep enhancing foods. So omega-3, cold water fish, things like salmon, mackerel, any of those oily fish are going to um, help with boosting omega-3s um, and vitamin D. Going to help release serotonin. Now, serotonin is our drug that we release when we're happy, when we're, um, we're feeling good. But serotonin actually makes you quite sleepy. So... By boosting serotonin, it helps your body wind down when you're getting ready for bed. Okay. Now, dark berries and cherries can in, can boost melatonin. Okay. Because our, although we want to have melatonin, we don't want to supplement with it. And I'll talk to that, talk to you about that before. Melatonin is actually a hormone. So by supplementing with melatonin, you can actually stop your body's production of it. And that's what we don't want. Okay. But um, dark berries and cherries have been known to increase your natural levels of melatonin. And a kiwi before bed, one study in particular showed there was an increase in sleep quantity and quality. Um, I don't know if that was actually literally having a kiwi fruit literally before bed. Um, but if you can get those foods throughout the day, they're going to help with melatonin and help with the quality of sleep. Let's get a few more. Okay, so from a... Um, nutritional standpoint, and I talk about this later on in terms of actual strategies, we don't want to have too much to eat, so a light dinner. But interestingly, you know, we've been told to avoid carbohydrates after seven. It's an old wives' tale. doesn't make you fat. doesn't matter when you have your carbohydrates. But interestingly, if you have more carbohydrates in the evening, you are going to spike your glucose and your insulin is going to go up. When your insulin, sugar goes up, your insulin gets released it will definitely make you sleepy. So what do we want come 8 or 9 p.m.? We want to be tired. We want to be sleepy. So having um, a lighter dinner with a good amount of carbohydrates is a very, very good technique for helping you get to sleep. Adequate protein throughout the day. Protein will release tryptophan and serotonin. We talked about melatonin. Slow-release carbs, oats, legumes, and sweet potato. Great. And, of course, it's always good advice anyway, never mind just for good sleep. We want to limit high fat, um, rich foods. All right, a few more uh, supplements. Talked about tryptophan, which is actually released in Turkey. Uh, released in Turkey, you can get that from Turkey. A good all round uh, multivitamin is a great idea for general health. And I talked about that in previous um, lives, but in particular, the B complex vitamins, fantastic. Magnesium and zinc. Um, melatonin, I've mentioned it because obviously people think. So many people start taking melatonin because they think, well, if I need to boost melatonin, why don't I actually supplement with it? Um, as I said, it's a, it's a hormone. And the problem with supplementing it, certainly on a daily level, is it will eventually stop your own production. And that's a very, very bad thing because then you would always need it and rely on it. And the problem, um, the problem with uh, supplementation, and I've put there three to 12 grams because I've seen some people actually taking 12 grams actually turns out you probably need closer to one or two grams but some of the tablets people are six grams each and they say take two before you go to bed 12 grams if you take 12 grams of melatonin you will wake up and it will feel like you've been drugged i've tried it you will feel like you feel so groggy the next morning um and counter counterintuitively you actually get a worse night's sleep when it's been, been tracked on sleep trackers, it turns out the quality of sleep is not as good there's a lot of tossing and turning so i don't recommend melatonin the only time that I recommend melatonin is jet lag. And I'm going to touch on jet lag, some protocols behind jet lag at the end of the sleep section. So we'll get to that in a bit. All right, I touched on vitamin D, two to 4,000 I use um, a day. Ideally, sunlight. In an ideal world, we would get all our vitamin D from sunlight. But if you're in Europe, certainly northern Europe and lots of other times throughout the year, the northern hemisphere, we're not getting enough sunlight on our body. So I recommend supplementing two to four thousand i use of vitamin d and here's an interesting one i've got to be very careful because this is actually illegal in some places thc oil which is the psychoactive part of cannabis endocannabinoid system now you've got cbd but you've also got the t cbd is the non-psychoactive 
um, which can help you relax. But THC oil is very, very potent. But again, check in your state if you're in the States. Certainly in the UK, it's illegal. But I know a guy that can get hold of some. Um, half a rice drop is very, very effective. Now, I take this occasionally, not to feel high. That's not what I'm doing it for. We're talking half a rice drop an hour before bed. It just helps to relax. It's like the equivalent of maybe having a strong glass of red wine, but without the downsides of an alcohol. So again, I'm not telling you to go out and buy THC oil or go to a local dealer. I'm just showing you all the ideas and supplements that I recommend and have used in the past. Okay, but check the legalities of this before you um, before you get into it. All right, some extra tips. A magnesium salt bath, fantastic. Magnesium bath salts, what that does, it's, it sort of shuts the nervous system down. Load of salts into a hot bath. Um, there's actually some research that shows hot baths and showers cool the body down, but then there's also some research that show a cold shower can actually cool the body down. Um, so I guess you need to try both. I personally um, don't like the hot shower or hot bath. Tends to, I tend to sweat, and although the internal temperature seems to drop, it, getting into bed, it makes me feel a little bit agitated. So for me, if I was going to do this, I always tend to go for the cold. Um, but magnesium in a hot bath, just in general, is a great way to shut the nervous system down. Maybe don't do it too close to bed if you tend to be like me and, and sweat so much. Uh, a great technique is chili pad. What it does, it's a, a system that actually pumps cold water into your blanket, into the duvet, and it can really help down, um, cool down, bring down the temperature of your um, uh, duvet, your sleeping temperature. It's fantastic. Uh, meditation is a great little idea for some people. Um, by the way, most of these techniques that I actually use myself, uh, meditation, I don't. I don't. I'm going to hold my hand up. I probably should meditate, but I don't have any problems sleeping, and I don't meditate. So, um, And grounding is a really good idea. Socks off. Get your feet onto the ground. Be careful um, with the stones and gravel. Do it on the grass. Don't do it in the pavement. Um, again, I don't. it's not something that I do, but these have been shown to actually really, really help. So I'm giving you everything I can and I'm being honest with what I do and what I don't do. If there's anything that I don't do, I will tell you. If I don't say I, I don't do it, you can assume that I actually put all these practices into um, my routine currently or have done. Right, but here's the interesting thing. You need to fix your habits and sleep hygiene before you look at nutritional supplements. You know, there's no point of taking all the supplements um, and doing all these things if you're still on your screen or you're drinking coffee or you're drinking a rich meal or drinking loads of alcohol. There's no point adding in. There's no point adding in any supplements. Supplement, the clue's in the word. Supplements is supplementation, Okay supplementation means but we need to get the basics in place all my clients there's no point them adding in anything like creatine or whey protein or a multivitamin if they're not getting to bed on time if they're not tracking their calories and if they're not getting their step count up so we'll always look at the basics first before we add in the additions and here's the people that this is for the people that say well like you know i can't go to bed earlier Okay, we always here's the thing the reality is it's been shown that you will get the best sleep for most people, not everyone. There's always going to be a few outliers that say, you know, I can get to bed at one and sleep amazing. It's been shown that if we get to bed between 9 and 11 p.m., we tend to get the best sleep before midnight, tends to give us the best quality sleep after midnight, the hours between 12 and 7. Going to bed, at, well, people say, Well, I go to bed at one and get up at 9 a.m., and maybe that's true. But those eight hours are not the same as going to bed at 10 p.m., get up at 6. And that's just the, the fact. But let's say you go to bed at 12 and you want to bring your bedtime forward to, say, 10 p.m. You don't jump from 12 to 10. The worst thing you can do is, is do a two-hour jump because you'll be staring at the ceiling. You bring it forward by 15 minutes. Okay, You come to 11.45, maybe 11.30, you do that for a week. Bring it forward another 30 minutes. Do that for a week. Bring it forward one hour. You gradually, it's like wean yourself off something. You're going to wean yourself in. You're going to slowly add it more so your body gets used to this. And so eventually you can say, okay, you know what? I want to go to bed at 10 p.m. every night. Change my routine. You're going to take time to do that. So that's just my recommendation. And that's just from a, 
personal perspective and anecdotally from thousands of hundreds of clients that I've worked with in the last 15 years, jumping forward in too big a jump early on is going to result in uh, you staring at the ceiling. And here's that bedtime ritual I talked about. So I said the best night's sleep comes from getting ready for an hour or even two hours, even three hours in some cases. And I'm going to give you a little technique, a three, two, one technique in a second. So the, a bedtime ritual, it sounds a bit wafty, a bit yeah, woo-woo, but the best sleepers have got some type of ritual. And whether they know it or not, whether they intentionally do it or not, whether they sit down and write a list out, but they will, the best sleepers, the people that get the best quality sleep, will do a lot of these techniques and they probably do it naturally if they even know that they're doing them, Okay. One hour before bedtime, no screens, no checking emails or the gram, because that blue light, that artificial light will interfere with your melatonin. Great thing is dim the lights. Okay, You can do that an hour before. So if you are in a room that's got lights on, just dim them down. You could even, if you really want to go there, you could turn the lights off and put a candle on. Okay, That's what we would do hundreds of years ago before electricity, electricity was invented. Candlelight, it's fantastic. What you do when you dim the lights and put a candle on, you, you signify to the brain, release melatonin, it's time to, time to wind down. Now, I defy anyone to read a book for more than 15 or 20 minutes without feeling tired. I can't read. I literally, if I try and read in bed, I just can't do it. I literally read the same page about five times. The same page, I didn't get a word of that. Same page. After about five goes and the book falling on my face, I just have to get rid of the book. Now I don't even attempt it because it's just not worth it, you know. Um, keep the room cool. We talked about that. Um, great technique is having sex. If you're married, partner, ideally with them. <laughs> you know, don't do it with someone else that's going to... Marital advice. I don't want to cause any problems. If your wife is up for some sex and she wants some sex, have some sex. An orgasm before you go to bed is one of the best ways just to relax. Oxytocin great for you it's great for her it's fantastic for your relationship and you're going to get some great sleep okay um all of this before 11 p.m or 11 uh, 10 p.m whatever your bedtime is rinse and repeat every night and you can work out what you don't have to do all of these things you don't have to do them all in that order you can do some of them but you want to be thinking if i'm going to bed at 11 o'clock come 9 p.m or 9 30 you want to think what am I going to do to start unwind? If you get out the food and you start drinking and you get your laptop on and start doing a project, and I'm, look, life's not ideal. You're going to do some of that stuff. You just are, because, you know, but in an ideal world, we want to have some sort of ritual that is going to ease us into sleep and help us get the best night's sleep. All right, here's that three, two, one rule that I talked about. And this is a really good technique. On from that. Three hours before bed, no alcohol. Two hours before bed, no food, and one hour before bed, no artificial light and screen time. If you can stick to that, if you can stick to that, and ideally three hours before bed, maybe quit alcohol altogether if you need it. But look, I like a drink a couple of times a week. So it's hard to try and get that. If you Maybe you're eating dinner at 6 p.m., 7 p.m. Make sure if you're going to have a drink on that night and you value your sleep and you're getting poor sleep, Get your drinks in three hours before bedtime. When I say get your drinks in, two drinks. If you have more than two drinks, it's going to affect your sleep anytime. Anyway, three or four drinks at 7 or 8 p.m., you're going to have sleep that's going to be um, affected on some level, and everyone's different. Now, you might think that you're sleeping heavily when you have alcohol. When it turns out, you're actually sedated. So the quality of your sleep is not very good when you've had alcohol. You might fall asleep. You might feel like you had been in a deep sleep, but you're not. You never actually go from being awake into deep sleep, deep restorative sleep. You're always in that level where rapid eye movement, where you're dreaming and you never really get into the, the good stuff. You feel like you are, but you're not. Okay, so three, two, one, no alcohol, three hours, two hours before bed, no food, one hour before bed, no artificial light and screen time. All right. Now, um, before we move on to the next um, uh, slides in the section, if any of you uh, want to speak to me about your health, your fitness, 
um, what you're struggling with, your sleep, the testosterone, all the things that we talked about. Here's my invite. If you want to sign up for a call, I'm more than happy to um, have a chat with you. So what I would do is go to, um, I've actually put the wrong link on there. Um, I've actually put the wrong slide on there. What you can do is go to gavgillibrand.com forward slash apply. That's gavgillibrand forward slash gavgillibrand.com forward slash apply. Or on my website, there's loads of links. That is an old link from an old slide. So I hold my hand up. I've made a bit of a mistake on there. But what I would like to do on the 15 minute call is find out where you are with your health and fitness, how much weight you want to lose if that's your goal. Um, what I think would be possible in a 12 or six week period. We're going to look at some of the obstacles in the way. And then I want to give you the two things that I've worked with my clients. If you do these two things, you're going to start to lose weight instantly. So the aim is to help you get some movement, get some weight loss, get things moving straight away. So if you want to book that call, gavgillibrand.com forward slash apply. Don't go to that link. That's annoying on my part. All right, there's a three, two, one rule. Okay, here's nine top strategies, and we're going to move into testosterone. And thanks for bearing with me if you're uh, watching or listening. So here's my top nine. That have all those strategies that I've looked at, these would be the ones that I would focus on first. Okay, so no caffeine, 2 p.m. Remember the half-life, six hours. Half of that caffeine is going to be in your blood six hours later. And then another six hours later, half of that still. So if you've got 500 milligram, if you have 500 milligram at 2 p.m., Come 8, um, 8 p.m., you're going to have 250 milligram. Come 2 o'clock in the morning, you're going to have 125 milligram, which will be enough to wreck your sleep, okay? Caffeine, 2 p.m., no booze, three hours before bed. We talked about that in the 3 two, one ritual. Um, one of the best things to do for good night's sleep, because uh, this what this does is regulates the circadian rhythm, is go to bed and get up at the same time every day of the week. I know most people don't do that. Weekdays tend to be more structured. Weekends tend to be later in bed. If you've got kids, you probably get up at the same time. But if you can keep your bedtime in and around within an hour of each other, getting up and going to bed at the same time is going to be the best thing for your circadian rhythm. We talked about keeping the temperature rule uh, cool, 19 degrees, but give or take. Eliminate all screen use one hour before bed. Dim the lights, read a book. And the big thing is exercise in the morning. With some sunlight, I should have put. One of the best things to do to regulate your circadian rhythm and to think about getting the best night's sleep is actually exercising in the morning. Studies have shown when you exercise in the morning, you're more likely to get a better night's sleep, better quality and quantity. Um, that said, if you can't exercise in the morning, life, family, kids, your job, whatever, get exercise done anytime during the day. But be careful going too late. If you're struggling with sleep, Go into the weight to the gym and smashing out weight training at 7, 8 p.m. Might not be the option. Might not be the best option for you. If it's the only option and you're trying to stay in shape, great. But if it's affecting your sleep and you value your sleep, it might be worth looking at moving that training time. Okay. All right. Very quickly on jet lag and then we'll move into testosterone. As I said, we've got a lot to cover here. I'm going to try and get this done in the next 15 minutes, but it might go on. All right. Jet top. Tips for jet lag, don't eat, fast on the flight. Look, we're not talking short haul, short haul, short journeys, we're talking long haul, T eight, 10, 12, longer. It's very hard to not eat on a tower flight, but it's one of the best techniques because it gives your digestion a break. You arrive in a different time zone where you're all upside down. One of the most expensive processes in the body is digestion. So if you haven't got any food to digest, it just really, really helps. No stimulants on the flight. That means no booze, no coffee, no caffeine. Easier said than done, I know, especially if you're maybe you're going on vacation or holiday. You want to have a couple of drinks. You want to enjoy yourself, relax. You're watching the movie. I get it. I'm just saying it's one of the best things for jet lag. Um, when you arrive at the destination, stay up to bedtime. Don't go to sleep during the day. Stay up to bedtime. Try and get through to 9 or 10 p.m., which I know could be 6 or 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning of your time, if you've gone that way, depending on which way it is. But stay up to the normal bedtime that you would on the new in the new time zone. That's when you can take one and a half to three grams of melatonin. And you're going to take that for uh, five or six days. You're going to take melatonin for five or six days. One of the best things to start regulating that rhythm 
in the new time zone. Just, I've missed this, should have said this before, when you're actually on the flight, three to five litres of water on long haul, on long haul flight. Now you're going to be peeing, you're going to be up and down the aisle, you're going to be in the toilet every half an hour. Just do it. You're going to piss off the person that's in the aisle seat if you're in the middle. Don't worry about them. Just keep drinking as much water as you possibly can. I asked the um, air stewardesses on how much they drink, and they're actually told in their training to massively hydrate because they know how dehydrating long haul flight can be. Okay, so three to five liters, it's easier said than done. When you arrive, um, don't go out drinking. Get to the hotel and you're going to have a cold shower and then you can do a little bit of exercise. And that could be just some press ups and body weight stuff. Maybe you go for a walk around the block, half an hour walk around the block, um, some press ups, some, some body weight squats, anything. You're just going to get the blood pumping, get you know oxygenated blood into the brain. It's probably the last thing you want to do. You want to go to bed, you want to go for a meal, you want to have some fun or whatever, don't. Get to the hotel, stay up, have the cold shower, do a little bit of exercise, and you'll the next couple of days you'll thank yourself for it, okay? Um, no booze that night. And you can get a little oxytocin nasal spray, a couple of little sprays in the nose. Oxytocin has been shown to mitigate the effects of uh, jet lag. Next day... You're probably going to be up at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> or if you've had your melatonin, you might sleep through. Let's say you make it through to four, five o'clock. Get up. Forget that you're on a different time zone. Stop saying, oh, it's um, oh, it'd be six o'clock back in the UK or wherever you, you know, you've come from. Don't say that. Just look at the time. Okay, it's 8 a.m. This is my time. And that's the best way to regulate your circadian rhythm and start feeling good and having energy and ready to rock, whether it's on vacation, holiday, business meetings, whatever you're doing. Okay, there's my jet lag. Tap, top tips. Whew. Right, action steps. What can you take from this? You can't do all of this. You can't do all of it. I don't recommend you do all of it. I want you to pick three things and focus on them. Change them, not all of them. So pick the top three things, and you're going to work on these for two weeks. So maybe you had one supplement in. Maybe you had um, something with no screen time. And maybe you bring your bedtime forward a little bit. Master those three. Make sure they become habitual before you add anything in. If you try and do all of this, if you're not doing any of it, you're going to fail miserably. Just a little drink. You're going to fail miserably. Right. Any questions from anyone? Anyone got any questions? No. No questions. Okay. We're going to look at testosterone and why it is the king, the daddy. All right, so if you don't know, testosterone is the male, the, the primary male sex hormone. Although women do have testosterone, but about 15 times less the amount of testosterone that men have. And we're focusing on men. This presentation is ideally mostly for men. Certainly this section on testosterone. The bit on sleep absolutely is for everyone. This bit is going to be really primarily focusing on men. The male sex hormone is responsible for increasing energy, mood, muscle mass, brain function, sexual function, fertility, red blood cells, and fat distribution. It's safe to say that this is one of the most important hormones in the body. And as we age, we lose it. It decreases every decade. We lose muscle mass. We tend to gain body fat. It can really mess up with... Um, our, our mindset, anxiety, it's so important to have adequate amount of testosterone in our body as we age as men. Okay, so what is it? So look, it's a chemical messenger that triggers change. And it's produced, chaps, it's produced in your balls, produced in the testicles, and the technical phrase is the Leydig cells, the Leydig cells in your testicles, and it also regulates sperm production. So if you're at the age that you're still interested in uh, fertility, it's absolutely crucial that we have a good amount of testosterone. But low testosterone is a problem. Um, and hypogonadism is will show up in signs of reduced sex drive, ED, which is erectile dysfunction, low sperm count, and gynecomastia. If you're not sure what gyno is, gynecomastia is actually the formation of breast tissue in males. Okay formation of breast tissue. It's not cancerous. So if you've ever had that or you know someone that's had that, it's not cancerous, but it is the gland that actually produces testosterone um, tissue. And that can happen in low testosterone, but also in very, very high testosterone. I mean, um, 
explain as we go through. But this low testosterone or hypogonadism can lead to loss of body hair, muscle mass strength, and a massive increase in body fat. And most men will experience this when they get into their 40s, certainly in their 50s and 60s. But there are things that we can do naturally, and we're going to look at some of the, the other options as well. But chronic low testosterone, someone that's got very, very low testosterone can increase the, um, the likelihood of osteoporosis, mood swings. It's a really big thing. A lot of people think it's just muscle mass and body fat, but one of the biggest things that we see in men as they age, they just don't have the drive. They're moody. They just don't have that oomph left in them. Mood swings, reduced energy, and testicular shrinkage. And no one wants to see their balls get small. No one. Not you, not me, not your wife, not your partner. No one wants to have small balls, purely from an aesthetic point of view. We just don't. So causes, injury, castration, no shit, Sherlock, infection, the various medications, opioid um, analgesics, which they're just painkillers, too much painkillers can cause this, diabetes, kidney and liver disease, obesity. My whole business is around um, helping people that are obese or avoid becoming obese, helping them lose body fat. And one of the biggest, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. It's like a chicken and egg. When you're obese, you've got a lot of body fat to lose. Your testosterone is low. When your testosterone is low, you're more likely to become obese. So the two are feeding each other. So when you're obese, it's hard to boost your testosterone. And it's hard to lose body fat because your testosterone is low. You've got less muscle mass, less energy. So it's a vicious circle. So we want to increase that because it's one of the best. It doesn't. That's not to say that you can't become obese if you've got high testosterone. You absolutely can if you simply eat more food than you need, more food than you burn, you're going to still gain weight. And various genetic diseases can cause um, hypogonadism. Uh, T levels will, will definitely drop as we age. I know this for a fact. I'm 49 years old. I know I only look 39, but that's another, another live for another time. Um, but look, our testosterone levels will fall 1.6% every year from 40 years old. So the testosterone you've got in your mid-40s is going to be massively reduced to when you're in your 20s or in your teens. It's actually said that we men peak around, around about between anywhere between 19 and 25 in terms of virility and, you know, having lead in our pencil. So it's a sledgy decline. It's a slippery slope, chaps. It's a slippery slope and we're all sliding down. <laughs> oh, God. Take me now. Um Age 60, most men, unless they're doing something to rectify it, will have hypogonadism. Small balls, lack of testosterone, increased body fat. And four out of 10 men have hypogonadism by age 45. Okay. We want you to be one of the six. You don't need to be one of the four. Let's be one of the six. Okay. Symptoms. Now, I want you to think if you've got any of these symptoms it doesn't necessarily mean you've got low testosterone if you've got more than three or four of these it might be worth looking at and there's things that we can do naturally and there's things that we can go down the drug route but we're going to look at some of the symptoms so first of all the biggest thing is um and you also see this funny enough a lot of these symptoms um are caused by obesity and of course obesity causes low testosterone but you could still have high testosterone and be obese. So the, some the symptoms often mirrored. Obesity can look at the can cause these symptoms, and low testosterone can cause these symptoms. But the two don't necessarily mean you've got both of them. I hope that makes sense. First of all, diminished erections. If you're struggling to get it up, could be, be a first sign of uh, having low testosterone. Decreased libido, which is obviously linked there. Mood changes. But then again, if you've got mood changes, doesn't necessarily mean you've got low testosterone. The only way to find out is to have a test. Reduce cognitive function. And that's where, you know, concentration, memory, and certainly drive, motivation. They're very linked. Uh, dopamine is very linked, highly linked to um, testosterone. Fatigue, depression, brain fog. A lot of the men that I work with often complain that they've just got this brain fog. They can't seem to concentrate and they're angry. Uh, they just, uh, you know, their just mindset just doesn't seem the same when they were in their 30s and their 20s. Might be worth looking at getting a test. Certainly a decrease in muscle, strength and hair. 
decrease in bone mass and mineral density. And we talked about, you know, how it can lead to osteoporosis and an increase in abdominal fat. Late onset hypogonadism has become a recognized medical condition, although many of the symptoms are associated with normal aging. So as we get older, a lot of those symptoms can just be from normal aging. But as we get older, it tends to sort of link very closely with a lack of testosterone. Oh, it's all a bit depressing, isn't it? What can we do about it? It's not all doom and gloom. Let's look at what we can do. That's what it is. That's what it does. But let's look at what, how we can change things and make things a lot better. All right, let's look at the natural ways to boost T. Natural ways to boost testosterone levels naturally. First of all, diet. Diet is one of the best ways. Good quality protein and adequate amounts of saturated fat have been proven to boost your T levels. Uh, goes without saying resistance training. One of the best ways to boost T. If you're doing squats, deadlifts, compound movements, you know, muscle um, sort of exercises that do one, two, three, four, or five, even more muscle groups at a time, you're going to boost your T levels. Regular cardio, keeping fit, keeping healthy, it's going to naturally boost your testosterone. A reduction in alcohol. One of the biggest things um, when someone shows signs of having low testosterone. The first thing that the doctor will ask is how much are you drinking? Because you could be smashing the alcohol. It can really, really reduce your levels of tea. So we want to, you know, minimize alcohol if we can. This ties nicely back into sleep, quality sleep, six to eight hours. And we've talked about all the, the methods and the strategies to get that. A reduction in stress. If someone's stressed, it will massively affect your levels of testosterone. Daily sunlight, vitamin D supplementation, and having sex. All you can see all of those, they boost T, but they also tie nicely into getting quality sleep. And the great thing is they tie up each other. If you're not getting very good sleep, or similarly, I've, I've not mentioned it because we've talked about sleep, but if you're getting great sleep, it's one of the first indicators that your testosterone levels will be maximized or at least optimized to a certain level. That said, you could be getting great sleep and you're not doing anything else your T levels are going to be limited. So it's a combination of getting great sleep and all these things come together that are going to cause you to have a great level uh, of testosterone naturally. All right, we're going to very quickly look at um, TRT and what it is, and then we're going to wrap it up. And I've gone a bit over, but there's a lot of information to cover. Thanks for bearing with me. So... Um, TRT, testosterone replacement therapy. This is for men. Many of you have heard of HRT for women, but this is kind of, it's not focused on. It seems a bit taboo, but it can be a game changer for many men. And I know this from um, working with men that have used TRT. Prescribed and monitored by doctor, but the first step, I'm not telling you to go and do this. The only way to see if you need TRT is to get a blood test. But before you get a blood test, you want to look at all the things you can do naturally. You've got to look at natural uh, strategies first before you go down the medical route. But once you if you still think you've got low testosterone, get a blood test. Uh, how it works? Basically, um, testosterone is replaced from an exogenous source, and it's self-administered with injection creams or patches. Okay, uh, but the the change in life can be dramatic. I've seen guys that have been feeling miserable, brain fog, just not just not enjoying life, literally be transformed. In a couple of weeks, great energy, strong erections, sex life, libido, feeling good, lots of drive, lots of energy, sleeping better. It can be an absolute game changer for some. Okay. Oh, this kind of ties into having, you know, great sleep and the benefits of normal testosterone, high in libido, sex drive, erectile quality, improvement in energy levels and cognitive function. Um, and we just mentioned all those. The short-term benefits are huge. The long term, several months down the line, and it does sometimes, some guys feel a difference after a couple of weeks. Some guys, it takes two or three months to really, really feel, feel the difference. But you're definitely going to see an increase in muscle growth. Um, definitely an increase uh, recovery after exercise. Full of facial hair, you tend to get more stubble, better bone and joint health, an increase in red blood cells, and improve immune, immune function. Okay. So, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, guys, if you go down there. But this is really important. It's important to remember that TRT is not a one-size-fits-all. If you know someone that's using TRT, 
his protocol or the dose that he's using is not necessarily what you need. Again, this is, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to tell you this is what you need. You know, to go and get this checked out by a doctor and an endocrinologist that's going to analyze your hormones and give you exactly what you need. Now, the side effects um, of having uh, too much testosterone, well, basically too much testosterone is a cycle of anabolic steroids. And that's not what we're talking about. Steroids, you know, a couple of the side effects, gynecomastia, which is that the breast tissue, high blood pressure, infertility, much more, and it will shrink your balls. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about a cycle of steroids. We're talking about um, increasing your T levels from TRT. That said, you can still get some testicular shrinkage, but there are certain things you can bring in to avoid that. And again, the doctor will help you with that and tell you what to, to have. Um, but it is a game changer. But it's often a life-changing protocol. Once you start, it's something that you need to say, am I going to do this for the rest of my life? And if you're in your late 40s and 50s and 60s, and you make that decision to do it, you don't want to look back, but it can be an absolute game changer. It's safe, it's effective if it's done correctly, safe, effective form of hormone replacement therapy. But here's the thing. I want you to realize that everyone is not having sex five nights a week. People talk about, oh, there's an amazing sex life. And I'm kind of making a joke of it. You've got the pictures of the beetle humping the other beetle. But just because you think everyone else is having sex five nights a week, they're not. They're not. I just want you to put your mind at rest. Everyone is not doing it like rabbits. <laughs> all right, here's your action steps. If you're looking to go down the medical route, first of all, exhaust all the natural ideas first. Look at them first. Get your bloods done and ask for the full hormonal panel, testosterone levels. Do your research. Get this checked out by a doctor, and it could be a game changer. All right, we covered a lot there, guys, in 50 minutes. Excuse me. Now, if you want to book a call, I mentioned this before, go to gabgillybrand.com forward slash apply. You can book a 15-minute call. We'll talk health, fitness, weight loss, give you some answers, look at the sticking points, Look at what's not working, you know, what is working um, to jump on that call. Also, if you want to download my cheat sheet, some of you might have had this, some of you won't, but let me pull this up. If you want a free copy, just email me, hello at gavgillyrand.com, or you can download it direct, gavgillyrand.com forward slash hacks, H-A-C-K-S, and it's the five unknown weight loss hacks. We're going to talk about testosterone, sleep. A lot of the stuff that we talked about in this presentation will be in there and a load more other stuff as well. So if you want a free copy, by all means, email me or you can get this off my website as well. So look, that's the end of the presentation, guys. Um, please book a call with me if you want to look at things further. This is just this is actually a small snippet of one of the modules that I cover in the coaching program that I have. So if you like the idea of this, it looks like your cup of tea and you want to learn more by all means, download the cheat sheet, book a call with me, and um, we'll take it from there. Hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I shall see you all soon. All the best.